Hello, everybody. Um, first, I want to introduce myself. Um, my name is Alyssa Peterson. I'm one of the new student success coordinators um, down on the second floor. If you would um, like to talk to me or come um, to my office to break down some more questions or need some extra help, um, please please feel free to email me after this. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, first, I'm gonna talk about um, fetal monitoring um, and how to break down and interpret the fetal heart rate with the fetal monitoring. So before we figure out how to interpret the baby's heart rate or mom's contraction, we need to know what the graph is and what it means. So. Um, from thick line to thick line is one minute, so you can see um, this one minute mark. Let me grab the laser. This one minute mark um, is from red line to red line, um, and then each of the small boxes are 10 second intervals. So um, there's six seconds in each. Um, from one thick line to the next thick line, that's showing your 60 seconds. So um, that's how we count um, our intervals and spacing um, of this uh, graph. And then the top section up here is always going to be where your fetal heart rate um, and your maternal heart rate are going to show. And then the bottom portion is going to be the uterine contractions. So. This is what we're going to be evaluating. So we want to know how to determine a fetal baseline heart rate, um, and we're also going to determine what type of um, periodic or episodic changes the baby's heart rate's having. So um, we want to first determine um, what type of variability they have. So that's that beat to beat um, change or fluctuation in the fetal heart rate. Um, and then they have accelerations, which are a positive reassuring sign, and then any decelerations. There's three typical types. We can have variables, earlies, or lates. Uh, so we'll talk about each of those. And then we'll move on to um, our uterus and how our contractions are doing. So we need to determine um, uterine frequency of our contractions, um, the intensity of our contractions, the duration of our contractions, and then also making sure that we have a good resting tone in between our contractions and our baby's getting enough of a break and a rest in between our contractions. So um, first we need to determine what our baseline is. So we have to have at least a 10 minute segment um, to figure out what our baby's baseline is. And the baseline is going to be where the fetal heart rate hits most frequently um, over that 10 minute period. Um, and we're gonna round to the nearest um, five beats per minute um, in increments of time. So our normal fetal heart rate is anywhere between 110 and 160. Um, so we're just going to find a, uh, our fetal strip um, and determine what our baseline is. We can't figure out what a baseline is um, if the baby's having any sort of um, decelerations or accelerations. So we kind of have to look in between these points um, to figure out exactly what our fetal baseline is. So. Um, let's move on. Um, bradycardia is anything less than 110 beats per minute. Tachycardia is going to be anything greater than 160 beats per minute. Um, and then um, if there is a change in the baseline, it has to be longer than 10 minutes and then it's considered a change. So if our fetal heart rate started out at um, 125 um, and then had an acceleration and just never came back down and our acceleration went up to 135 and lasted for longer than 10 minutes, then that would be considered a baseline change, not necessarily um, an acceleration anymore. So um, variability, that's that beat to beat fluctuation of the fetal heart rate. So those are kind of what I call the squiggles on the fetal, fetal monitoring. So um, we're going to um, kind of dive in deeper with that. So um, 
absent variability, um, that's when there's zero beat to beat per minute um, undulations or uh, amputudal change um, in the fetal heart rate. So it's a complete flat line. They still have a heart rate, um, and a flat line can be kind of a, a triggering word for nursing students, um, but they still have a fetal heart rate. It's just absent variability. There's no um, changes in that fetal heart rate, um, and that's a pretty ominous sign when we're talking about babies. Minimal variability is less than five beats per minute of ampl amplitude above or below the baseline. Um, so that's why it's really key and important to determine a baseline first, and then we'll figure out what type of variability they're having. So minimal, um, they can go through periods of minimal variability for short periods of time. Sometimes they'll go through sleeping cycles and have minimal variability. As long as they kind of wake back up or they come back to moderate variability, which is 6 to 25 beats per minute um, above or below the baseline. That's kind of our gold standard. That's where we want them to be. That means our baby is well oxygenated, happy, um, and uh, tolerating labor. Marked variability is anything that's greater than 25 beats per minute. Um, and really, it's hard to determine exactly what your baseline is if they are truly having marked variability. Um, Marked variability, you typically don't see it last for extended periods of time. I always kind of say it, it's kind of like your baby's waving his white flag before he's really going to get stressed out and then the fetal heart rate decelerates and um, either into a prolonged deceleration or, um, you know, a, a, a late deceleration. So that marked variability is, is kind of a sign that your baby is stressed out. Um, and this isn't... Uh, truly a, a variability pattern, um, but it kind of goes along with it. Um, the sinusoidal pattern um, is a regular um, undulating pattern. It's smooth uh, and it's going to last longer than 10 minutes. And this is an, also an ominous finding. This indicates that um, sometimes this will happen to with babies that um, have some fetal anemia going on or um, they're in severe um, they're severe hypoxic. Um, so that is something that we really need to act quickly on. Um, if it's true sinusoidal patterns, we should be kind of opening the operating room and delivering quickly because that means our baby's really in trouble. So here's some examples um, of everything that we talked about so far. Absent variability, um, it's truly zero beats per minute above or below that baseline. That line is just completely flat. Um, it's going to be 135, 135, 135, 135, 135, all the way through. Um, and so we really need to act on that as well. Um, we can reposition mom, sometimes give her a little bit of a fluid bolus, try to wake that baby up um, and get some um, better variability out of the, ba the baby's heart rate. Minimal variability, and um, this is that um, less than five beats per minute of variation above or below the baseline. Um, like I was saying, babies can sometimes go through sleep cycles um, and have minimal variability. Um, moms that have just received um, narcotics or pain medication, or maybe a mom is on magnesium, a baby's going to typically have that minimal variability because they're kind of feeling the effects of everything that mom's getting as well. So, you know, um, magnesium is that smooth muscle relaxer. It's going to really relax babies down as well. And then same thing, baby's going to feel the effects of all the any narcotics that we give mom through the IV. So they'll go through periods of minimal variability. As long as they kind of wake back up, um, then it's, it's okay to watch that for a little while. Moderate variability, 6 to 25 beats per minute. This is where we want to be. This is kind of like I said, gold standard, we're, um, we know baby's well oxygenated, um, and it's a reassuring sign to see that moderate variability. And again, we're ch checking moderate variability in between any sort of periodic changes. So um, in between these big accelerations that are happening right here, we want to determine what our baseline is in between them. So we kind of have to look past that or kind of cut those out for a second and then we can determine our baseline for the rest of our, our 10 minute strip over here. Um, and then this is an example of marked variability. 
So again, greater than 25 beats per minute of variation. Um, you really can't determine a baseline here. Um, there's, it's just too um, much variability to determine exactly where your baseline is. Um, and again, this is a baby that's stressed out. Um, probably not going to see this for an extended period of time before their uh, fetal heart rate really decelerates and you're run into the OR fast. And then this is the example of that sinusoidal. So you can tell that it's different than just minimal or moderate. It's much more regular, uh, much more patterned. Um, sometimes babies can have what's called uh, pseudo sinusoidal um, fetal heart rate patterns and that's after you give mom maybe some IV narcotics for pain while they're in labor um, but true sinusoidal patterns will last um, continuously no matter what interventions you did beforehand or what interventions you're doing to try to fix it and get them out of that sinusoidal pattern um, it's just an insult to the baby and they can't they can't get out of that pattern this is a great little mnemonic that I tell every nursing student that they need um, veal chop to determine kind of what causes what in fetal heart rate patterns and what can I do to fix it. So um, variables, um, variable decelerations are going to be related to cord compression. Early decelerations are going to be related to head compression. Um, accelerations are okay, they're good, they're reassuring, and then late um, decelerations are going to be related to placenta um, perfusion or placenta in, uh, insufficiency. So um, this is great um, thing to kind of just remember, um, especially when you have those test questions when um, you know your patient's having early decelerations, um, you know, what are they, um, as a nurse, what are you concerned of or what do you think that is happening with the status of your patient? Um, and so you know early decelerations are related to head compression. Um, it's just a normal vagal response from the baby, uh, especially you're going to see those the later in labor um, because the baby's head is going to be more engaged and uh, much more well applied onto that cervix and um, in, in the pelvis. And so they're going to have a lot more head compression, so they're going to have those early decelerations. If I start noticing early decelerations on my fetal, my patient's fetal monitor, and she's been, you know, eight centimeters all day, and all of a sudden she calls out and tells me, she's feeling pressure and then I notice that the baby's also having early de early decelerations, that's a big hint for me to check her cervix and see what she's dilated to. She's probably not eight centimeters anymore. We're probably much further along than that. So um, this is a great little mnemonic to figure out what is related to what and what you can do for that. So accelerations, um, again, those are okay. Um, um, they are in a um, also lessons, uh excuse me there's a typo um, accelerations are at least 30 seconds and um, less than two minutes in duration so for a patient that is um, less than 32 weeks, your accelerations are going to be 10 by 10. They have to go up 10 beats per minute and have to last at least 15 seconds. Um, but a patient that is, or a fetus that is 32 weeks or older, um, they're going to have a 15 by 15. So up 15 beats per minute from their baseline and has to last at least um, 15 seconds and a prolonged acceleration is going to be anywhere between um, 2 to 10 minutes, but again, over 10 minutes um, is going to be considered a baseline change. So here's some examples of your acceleration. Um, it's kind of hard to determine what our baseline is here because the baby is having so many um, accelerations, um, but you can kind of draw an imaginary line um, down here and probably our baseline is right around um, 150 uh, maybe 145 um, and then 
if you can see, this fetal heart rate comes up all the way to 170, um, and then we're lasting at least 15 seconds, because remember, each of these small boxes are 10 seconds, so we're lasting 10, 20, 30, at least 40 seconds. Um, and again, over here, we're going up at least 15 beats per minute and lasting greater than 15 seconds. Um, and accelerations can really happen with or without a contraction. Again, it's just a reassuring sign um, that our baby is well oxygenated um, and it's a reassuring sign to have those accelerations. Um, and I always try to look for my accelerations first before I find um, any decelerations. Um, just my good optimistic labor nurse in, in me. So um, whenever I'm teaching students about fetal strips, um, you know, first you want to determine a baseline, then you want to determine your variability, and then you want to look for any of those changes. So um, we'll start with accelerations, um, and when we're kind of combing over our chart and combing over our strip, um, depending on how often the nurse is charting, um, you know, if it's every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes, every hour, depending on what's going on with their patient and um, what phase or stage of labor that they're in. Um, you know, we kind of just want to do a quick overview of the strip, and then if we see one acceleration within that 30 minute period, um, then we can document that they had one acceleration. You don't have to, you know, kind of comb the entire chart to see, you know, how many accelerations did they have. If they have one, that's, that's considered sufficient, that's enough. So you can move on to the next one. And um, the rest are um, considered decelerations. So there's the early deceleration, a late deceleration, a variable deceleration. Um, those can be recurrent or prolonged. Um, and then episodic changes are going to be when any of these decelerations are not associated with uterine contractions. So um, typically those are going to be variables, and variables can be either episodic or um, periodic. Um, it's because remember, variables are related to cord compression. So it could be that the mom's not having any contractions and the baby just kind of rolled over and, and brought the cord with him and tightened up his cord as he churned. And so they had that cord compression. The baby's fetal heart rate went down, but then, you know, they rolled off their cord and it came up really quickly. It had nothing to do with the contraction. Um, just had to do with like either fetal, fetal position or, you know, sometimes the baby will um, or the fetus will hold the cord in their hand and they're, you know, squeeze the cord and um, kind of cut off their own circulation until their fetal heart rate gets low enough to where they relax their hand and then their heart rate comes back up. And then, um, you know, that's not related to a contraction either. That can just happen out in the middle of nowhere. Whereas periodic changes are going to be um, any sort of deceleration associated with uterine contractions. So Earlies and lates have to always be periodic changes because that's how we measure them in relationship to the contraction. Um, and then variables can also be periodic because um, if you think about it, if the mom is having contractions, that uterus is kind of squeezing around the baby, which is causing cord compression whenever the uterus squeezes, depending on what position the cord is in or where the cord is at in relation to the baby in the uterus. Um, so it can kind of temporarily cut off um, circulation to the baby through the cord that way. But then once the contraction's over, then um, the cord has a little bit of space and then can um, adequately perfuse to the baby. So variables are related to cord compression. Um, it's an abrupt diesel, uh, decrease in the fetal heart rate. It's going to go down at least 15 beats per minute from where our baseline is. Um, and it's going to take less than 30 seconds to get from the start of our deceleration to the nadir of our deceleration, so the very bottom point um, of the fetal heart rate. Um, and then um, it has to last for at least 15 seconds. Um, but if it's greater than two minutes, it's considered a prolonged deceleration uh, or a prolonged, yeah, prolonged deceleration. Um, so it's kind of like the opposite of an acceleration, kind of. Um, they're going to have kind of a V shape or a U shape because it is so abrupt. 
um, and things that you can do when you have those priority qu type questions um, when you take your exam um, is position change, right? Because if it's um, a variable, it's related to cord compression, the first and fastest thing that I can do is hopefully get that baby off the cord and um, give it a little bit more um, space to, to circulate into the baby. So other options that we can do is oxygen, fluid bolus, um, and then you know if they're contracting just way too much and they're on Pitocin, we're always going to either decrease Pitocin or turn it off. But first thing that we can do as nurses is position change. It's the fastest and most effective thing that we can do um, in the labor room. And then if they're really bad or recurrent decelerations, um, we could consider an amnio infusion or, um, you know, if they're not on Pitocin and they're just contracting away by themselves um, and are in a terrific pattern, but maybe the baby's not tolerating it, they're contracting too much, then we can give terbutaline to mom um, to help slow down the contractions and give baby a little bit of a break. So this is what a variable deceleration is gonna look like. Again, so here's the start of your decel, and here's the nadir. It's gonna take less than 30 seconds to get from here to here. It has to go down at least 15 beats per minute. It has to last at least 15 seconds. So here are um, other examples of your variable deceleration. And a lot of times, another way that you can kind of distinguish between variables or lates or earlies um, is they have these little shoulders on the uh, opposite sides of the deceleration. So um, it's kind of like, I always describe it as um, the baby's taking a big deep breath before they have to go underwater. So they take, they take that big deep breath and then they kind of have to hold their breath while their head's getting ducked underwater. And then as they come back up, they take their big deep breath and then um, continue on. So. It's another way to just kind of um, identify whether it's a variable deceleration. Do you see how it's abrupt? It takes less than 30 seconds to get from the start of your deceleration to the nadir of your deceleration. So if each one of these boxes are 10 seconds, it's only really taking us about 15 seconds to get from here to here. We're definitely going down at least 15 beats per minute if our fetal baseline is uh, around 140 up here um, and then it's lasting for at least 15 seconds so uh, 10, 20, 30, almost 35 seconds um, is how long these variables are lasting. So um, again things that we can do for this um, is position change because if you kind of think about it if my mom's laying on her left side um, the baby's also kind of um, is working with gravity and, and most of the fetal weight is going to be on the left side. Well, if my cord is on the left and kind of hanging out underneath the baby, every time she has a contraction, the pressure from the baby um, is getting pushed onto that cord and so we're dropping our fetal heart rate. And so a quick easy fix that we can do, move mom over to her right and now the pocket of fluid where the cord is um, is going to hopefully have a little bit more room so well, we can circulate freely with or without contractions to the baby. A really great position for variables um, with moms that are having recurrent variables and it really doesn't matter what position you put them in, they just keep having these variables, um, is to stick them up in high fowlers. Because if you think about it, all the pressure, you know, I can't see where the cord is. It could be wrapped around the baby's neck. It could be twisted all the way around the baby. It's in the front, the back, on the side. You know, I don't know. I don't have a sonogram. I can't um, constantly monitor where that cord is while she's in labor. Um, but I know if I sit her straight up in high fowlers, all the pressure and the weight from the baby is going down onto that cervix and into the pelvis. And so there's definitely not a cord down there. Um, or if there is, we got bigger problems. We could potentially be running into um, a cord prolapse. So um, hopefully if we sit mom straight up in high fowlers, then um, wherever the cord's at, um, hopefully it'll get a little bit of cushion because uh, the, the baby's weight is off of that uh, cord and not getting compressed as much. So early decelerations, um, these are caused by head compression. So it is a gradual decrease in the fetal heart rate and um, with the onset of the D cell um, to the nadir is greater than or equal to 30 seconds. So it's a little bit more gradual, it's a little bit more subtle than 
um, that variable deceleration where it had to be less than 30 seconds. Um, and the nadir occurs with the peak of the contraction. So they kind of mirror each other. Um, again, this is a vagal response from the baby. Um, and there's nothing that you really need to do um, other than maybe do a cervical exam and see if you're getting closer to delivery. But really, honestly, if the mom's not feeling that pressure um, to push, um, even with the best epidural in the world, they still feel the pressure and the urge to push. Um, so it doesn't even really matter if mom's going uh, natural without any pain medication or she's got the best epidural in the world and she's completely numb. They still feel that urge to push that pressure um, once the baby has really descended into the pelvis. So if babies have in these, like early decelerations, as long as their fetal heart rate is recovering back up to the baseline and you have good variability, then you can just kind of watch it closely and, and continue on. So again, this is your early deceleration. See how it kind of mirrors it? So here's the start of my contraction, the start of my decel. Takes greater than 30 seconds to get from the onset to the nadir. So if each one of these boxes are 10 seconds, we're at 10, 20, 30, 40 and a half. Um, and then we recover at the end of our contraction. So it's a perfect little mirror. It's just the baby's head's getting squeezed. So not the greatest picture, but you can really see um, how it mirrors closely. And with early and late decelerations, it does not matter how low the fetal heart rate gets from your baseline. Whereas like a variable, it has to be at least 15 beats per minute below your, what your baseline is. And early or late, it can be real subtle. It can be real gradual. Um, you know, our baseline could be 135 and our fetal heart rate only goes down to 130. Um, but it's this, uh, it takes longer than 30 seconds to get from 135 to 130 um, and it mirrors it exactly from your contraction. So um, you can kind of draw a line straight up from the start of your contraction to the end of your contraction and see that it fits perfectly, the deceleration fits perfectly um, into that box. And then this baby's also having an aceleration over here. So um, this is re still very reassuring. We know our, our kid's still doing okay. Um, late decelerations, these are kind of the worst ones. Um, this is when you wanna do your interventions probably pretty quickly. Um, late decelerations um, is a gradual decrease in the fetal heart rate with the onset of the D cell to the nadir greater than or equal to 30 seconds. So um, similar or exactly in the same as a early deceleration. The difference here is that the onset of the D cell occurs after the beginning of your contraction. So the nadir of the D cell occurs after the peak of your contraction. Everything is kind of shifted over to the right. Um, if I'm laboring a mom and I see um, a, de a late deceleration, I'm going to go there in there immediately um, and reposition her and give her some oxygen, right? Because um, it's that uh, placenta perfusion, the baby's not getting enough oxygen through the placenta, whether Maybe our placenta is just old and has some calcifications. Um, maybe the mom just got um, an epidural and so her blood pressure is compromised from that and so we're not perfusing as well through um, the placenta and so baby's not getting enough oxygen and nutrients through the placenta because mom's blood pressure is low and so we just can't get enough to the baby. Um, or, you know, maybe we're just kind of didn't luck out in the, the good placenta genes with this, this pregnancy and for whatever reason our placenta just hasn't um, developed properly and we're just not getting enough oxygen to the baby, especially if we're stressed out and we're having contractions. So we're gonna have those late decelerations. Um, so if I see one late, I'm going in there and doing interventions. Whereas like if I see it early, I'm just gonna kind of watch it and see it. If I see one variable, it could be that the kid just rolled over on the cord and then it'll correct itself. You know, by the, if it does it again, then I'll definitely go back in there and, and do my interventions. But if I see one late, I'm definitely going in there because it can really snowball quickly um, out of control. So see how everything's just kind of shifted to the right. So the peak of my contraction is when the start of my D cell occurs. And then the nadir of my 
D cell doesn't happen until after my contraction is over, and then I don't recover until well after my contraction is over. This just means that your baby is having a real hard time. They're definitely struggling. Um, you need to go in there and do some inner uterine resuscitation to, to help them out. So you can see here, again, not the best quality of picture, but everything's shifted over to the right. So um, the start of my deceleration um, and the start of my contraction are not equal like it was with an early deceleration. And then the peak of my contraction and the nadir of my decel, um, again, everything's kind of shifted over to the right. So recurrent decelerations, um, it can be a variable, an early or a late, but it's going to occur with more than 50% of uter contractions in any 20-minute segment. So here is our, um, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 14 minute segment, 15 minute segment, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six contractions, five and a half contractions in this strip, um, and we're having a variable, uh, we have variables with one, two, three, four of them, and then this looks a little bit like an early here, so we're having some sort of deceleration with every contractions. Um, these are definitely reoccurrent, um, something that we need to go in and fix. And you can kind of see how it progresses, whereas, you know, they start to have one variable, but they recover and they're doing okay. And then each one just progressively gets deeper and longer and um, wider. And so it can really get out of control really quickly. And then your baby is going to start to lose their reserve. Um, and then eventually they're going to decelerate and their heart rate's not going to come back up. Um, and then that would, you know, require an emergency C-section, which, you know, is scary for mom and their family, not their plan. is much more dangerous for mom and the baby. Um, so if we can kind of fix these with our interventions earlier on in the fetal tracing instead of watch them and just see, well, maybe it'll correct itself or maybe it'll figure itself out, um, you know, we want to go in there and try to fix it before it gets too bad. So this is a prolonged deceleration um, this is where it goes down at least 15 beats per minute from our baseline and lasts greater than two minutes. Um, so, and uh, if it lasts longer than 10 minutes, then we should be um, on our way to the operating room to, to have a baby out quickly. Um, so this is where you can kind of see maybe it started as a late, but it just never recovered and it took much longer than two minutes to get back up to our baseline. So um, this is when we're coming into the room and there's probably several nurses and doctors um, and your charge nurse is going to be in there, you know, flipping and flopping the patient, giving her oxygen, turning off the pit if she's on Pitocin, um, giving her a fluid bolus, doing all the interventions possible to try to help resuscitate this baby in utero rather than have to um, you know, have an emergency C-section to get him out quickly. So now that we have um, figured out baby, now we have to look at our contractions and determine um, what's going on with them. So with contractions, we're monitoring the frequency, intensity, duration, and we also want to note the resting tone um, of our uterine contractions. So frequency, how often you're contraction, uh, contracting, so that is the measurement from the beginning of one contraction to the start of the next one. So the beginning of, the, of contraction that you're starting on to the next contraction, but it's the beginning of it. Uh, your intensity is how strong each contraction is, so it's going to be either mild, moderate, or strong. Um, and if you are using an external monitor, you have to palpate in order to determine the intensity. Um, and an intrauterine pressure catheter or an internal monitor will measure the intensity for you. And so we'll kind of look at that a little bit later. Um, the duration is how long each contract contraction lasts. So the beginning of one contraction to the end of that same contraction. That's your duration of your contraction. And then your resting tone, you're wanting to look in between um, your uterine activity and your contractions 
and making sure that the baby's kind of getting a break in between those contractions. You know, like I said, I kind of um, relate uh, contractions like babies getting their head dunked underwater. And so um, we'll kind of talk about that here in just a bit as well. So here's a great little picture to show exactly how you're going to monitor these contractions. Frequency is the beginning of one contraction, counting the minutes to the beginning of the next contraction. Duration is the beginning of one contraction to the end of that same contract contraction. Here's where you're going to determine your resting tone, and then intensity is going to be from your baseline or your resting tone up to the, the peak of your contraction. So frequency, um, we can kind of um, do these together and uh, see exactly how long they're, uh, her, how often she's having contractions. So um, it always kind of trips students up whenever their contraction starts in the middle of the minute. It doesn't have to be an exact number. It doesn't have to be, um, you're kind of rounding to the nearest whole minute or half minute. Um, and so with frequency, you just want to kind of go, I always tell students to frog hop. So if you go to the start of this contraction, you're going to frog hop to the next minute mark where that would be. So that's one minute, and you're going to frog hop to the next one. That would be two minutes. And we're pretty close to our, the start of our next contraction. So um, those are about every two minutes apart. But let's keep going and go from the start of this contraction to the start of this contraction. So um, well, this is lucky. It starts right on that minute mark. So we'll go one two and a half. So this was two minutes apart, this is two and a half minutes apart, and so let's do our last contraction um, frequency and um, see how far apart these are. So this one starts kind of right in the middle, so to the middle of the next one, to the middle of the next one, two, um, and that really is, is close enough. And so these are about every two to two and a half minutes apart. Um, and that's completely appropriate to, to put on your documentation. Um, how, how frequently she's having contraction. Um, these contractions down here, um, here's our one minute mark, these like little thicker lines. And so if we start right here, we're gonna go to the next thick line, that's about a minute, and then we're having our next contraction. Again, this one's starting right in the middle. One minute, we're at the next contraction. One minute, we're at the next contraction one minute, we're at the next contraction. So she's having contractions about once once a minute, um, and that's really too close. This is what she, would be considered um, tachycystole or, or hyperstem. Um, she's having too many contractions, and this is when the baby's gonna have a real hard time recovering because they just aren't getting enough of a break in between these contractions. They're too close together. Um, they're gonna start to run out of reserve um, and, and show signs of that with their fetal tracing. They're gonna start to have decelerations. They're gonna have lates. They're gonna probably have um, prolonged decelerations and you're gonna kind of make more work for yourself and have worse outcomes for your patients. So, um, this is um, something that if your um, patient was on Pitocin to help augment or um, induce their labor, then we would want to turn the Pitocin either off or down, definitely down. Um, but it, sometimes women will get into a pattern like this all on their own without anything, without any um, extra help or um, Pitocin or um, anything that we can do to help uh, augment their labor and so if the baby if she was doing this on her own as long as the baby was tolerating it and it looked okay then we just let her do it right there's we can't that's just what our body's doing naturally um, but if her body's doing this naturally and the baby's starting to get stressed out well then we can bring some uh, terbutaline in and help slow her contractions down and hopefully space them out a little bit so that the baby gets a break in between those contractions and that she can still progress through labor, um, but we want it to do it safely um, and we definitely need to keep our baby happy during labor as well. So duration, this is where we're gonna be monitoring from the beginning of um, one contraction to the end of that same contraction. So. Sorry, these pictures are kind of fuzzy and blurry, but um, each of these um, boxes right here are 10 seconds. So 
we just kind of want to start where it starts. And some people, you know, it, it can be a little objective. So some people would start right here. Some people would start right here. Some people would start in the middle of that. Um, so we'll just kind of start um, right around here and, and count forward. So this would be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 seconds. And we'll go to this next one. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 seconds. And then we'll go to this last one. Uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 seconds, maybe a little bit 110. Um, so we want to pick our range, right? We want to pick our range where it's got the shortest contraction, the longest contraction um, in that 30 minute period or 15 minute period or hour long period, however often we're documenting. Um, and that's our range for our duration. So same thing with frequency. You kind of want to pick the two that are closest together, the two that are furthest apart, and that's your, your range for your um, frequency and duration. So. Um, we can say this patient up here on top is having contraction duration of anywhere between 50 seconds and 100 seconds. So, um, and then we can do the same thing down here, just finding the duration. And these contractions are a little bit more spaced out than the one on top. So our intensity, um, to monitor intensity, um, you have to palpate. You have to put your hands on your patient and really feel before, during, and after your contraction to see um, how intense your contractions are. So it typically kind of runs along with the phases and stages of labor. Like if they're in early labor and they're only three centimeters, then they're probably not booming out contractions that are, you know, lifting them off the bed. Um, they're probably pretty mild. If they can still walk, talk, and breathe through their contractions, um, they're probably pretty mild. The more intense and the further along in labor you get, the stronger your contractions are going to get. But um, here's just a quick little um, way to kind of compare the intensity of your contractions, um, your patient's contractions, to how you can feel on your own body. And so if you kind of put your finger on the tip of your nose, you can feel the cartilage. Um, it's real squishy, but um, you can feel that firmness underneath. You can feel the bone all the way under there. And so that's what um, at the peak of your mild contraction feels like. You can still push an indent, um, but you feel that uterus, um, you know, way under there, and it's still, you can feel that contraction. Um, moderate contractions, you're going to put your finger and palpate your chin. Um, it's a little bit firmer than your nose. Um, that bone, your chin bone is a little bit firmer. The uterus is going to be a little bit stronger and harder, um, but you can still feel that kind of layer of fat over it. Um, that would be a moderate contraction. And then a strong contraction is you just palpating your forehead. It's just rock hard. Sometimes even people even say like their elbow. Um, you can palpate your elbow and it's just, it feels like a rock in their abdomen. And so that's how you're going to monitor your intensity for your contractions. And so, um, especially if they have an uh, external monitor, I always kind of tease and joke because it's always the mother-in-law sitting in the corner or watching the strip who doesn't really know what they're talking about. Um, and they're looking at the strip and it, you know, looks really big on the monitor and then, you know, they're telling their daughter-in-law like, ooh, this is going to be a big one, Don't, you know, your, this one's going to hurt. <laughs> um, and it doesn't show intensity. Um, and so there's so many variables with the TOCO. You know, it could just be placement. Um, it could be um, adipose tissue, like fluffier moms are um, not going to show contractions, you know, super intense. Whereas you have those moms that are just super, super skinny and they've done CrossFit their entire pregnancy and they have, you know, 2.5% body fat. Um, there's no tissue or fat in between um, the abdominal wall and the uterus. And so, you know, tiny, tiny little contractions where she looks totally fine and, you know, is chatting through the contractions are going to look like this on the monitor. Um, whereas someone um, who has a little bit more fluff um, might really have contractions that are this intense and are super strong, as strong as you would palpate your forehead, but it's going to look like this on the monitor. So what it actually looks like on the fetal strip isn't accurate with the external monitor.
but that changes when that changes when you have the uh, intrauterine pressure catheter or the IUPC. And so if you have your baby and your mom on the monitor, on the strip it'll show you what kind of monitor is being used. And so this fetal strip and um, the contraction pattern up here on this top um, graph is a TOCO. And so you can see they look much more intense than um, they might actually be with the IUPC or the intrauterine pressure catheter. They're not going up as high as they are what it looks like on the TOCO. So this could be the same exact woman. They have the TOCO on. They look very intense, but they're really not that intense. And so um, that's kind of one of the reasons why we would even want to put an IUPC in in the first place. You know, say maybe a woman is having contractions, she's in a good pattern, um, she's contracting about every two to four minutes, but she just hasn't made any cervical change. And, um, you know, she's been a six for over four hours and we just can't get her past that hump. Well, we break her bag of water and we put in that intrauterine pressure catheter and then we can see like, well, yeah, she might be in a great pattern, but her contraction intensity isn't very high. Like the contractions just aren't strong enough for her to be making cervical change. Um, and so that's when we can monitor and adjust her. Like if she was on Pitocin, we could increase her Pitocin to make them much more intense and uh, much stronger in order for her to then make cervical change. Um, and then this is um, an example of resting tone. So again, the resting tone is um, the space in between your contractions, um, kind of making sure that the baby gets a break in between your contractions. So you can see up here that our resting tone is very high. It should be um, down here, um, kind of between um, you know, 5, 10, maybe 15 uh, millimeters per mercury. Um, down here. Um, so this is really just telling us that the baby's truly not getting a break in between the contractions. The uterus is still um, tense and contracting even in between the contractions. And so if you kind of think about it as every time a ba every time mom has a contraction, baby has to hold their breath underwater. They have to take a big deep breath at the top and hold their breath for a minute and then um, when they come back up for air, then they get this break, right? They get a break of two to three minutes, and then I gotta take a big deep breath again, hold my breath, and then I can come back up for air and rest and recover in between. So if I'm never really getting a chance to rest and recover in between my contractions, then my baby's really not gonna tolerate that for long. It's gonna run out of reserve. It's gonna um, start having that marked variability um, and then eventually have a prolonged deceleration or uh, you know, a, a poor outcome. And so um, this is something that you really need to monitor closely, especially if your patient's on Pitocin, because if your patient's on Pitocin and you just keep cranking up the pit and your baby's really never getting a chance to recover because you're contracting too much and your resting tone is never really relaxing, your uterus is never really relaxing, well, that's not gonna look great in a court of law. Um, if they say, well, why did you go up on the Pitocin? Well, because the doctor told me to. It's not a good enough answer. You still have to think, think critically, um, and you're the one that's managing that Pitocin, so um, you're in charge of it. So once we have all of that data compiled um, with our baseline, variability, fetal heart rate, and contractions, um, we can kind of determine which category our fetal heart rate pattern is in. So a category one tracing is completely perfect, right? We have um, our baseline is within normal range between 110 and 160. Um, we have moderate variability. We have A cells present. We can have earlies, um, and, and that's still acceptable to be a category one because remember that's just a normal vagal response from the baby, nothing we can really do to fix it other than push and have a, have a delivery. Um, you're not going to have any late decelerations, you're not going to have any variable decelerations, there's no interventions required for category 1 tracing. This is where we want to be and this is where we want to live, um, but I have never labored and delivered a patient um, that has just completely stayed in the category 1 
um, the entire time of their labor. So, but this is the patient that can um, get up and walk around. They can do intermittent monitoring. Um, they don't have to be on continuous monitoring. Um, you know, the baby really looks good. We can kind of check in every once in a while, um, but for the most part, our baby's very reassuring. Um, we kind of can expect normal um, fetal uh, acid-based gases um, from, from this baby. The category, well, we'll kind of skip to a category three because category two can sometimes be a little bit of a catch-all. So it can be really, really good, it can be really, really bad, or it can be, you know, kind of everything in between. And so um, category three, um, this is when we should be open, opening the operating room and getting a baby out quickly. So this is if our fetal heart rate is bradycardic, less than 110. We have recurrent late decelerations. We have recurrent variable um, decelerations uh, with uh, declining or absent variability. So that beat to beat per minute um, is gone and we're having recurrent variables. Um, or um, sinusoidal pattern. Remember that, that kind of pattern we talked about in the beginning where it's that undulating smooth pattern um, that is all of these things, if our baby is here, we need to be getting the baby out sooner rather than later. Um, and you need to be calling your providers and, and saying that, you know, this doesn't look right. We need to do something about this. Category two, like I said, is kind of the catch-all in between. So um, if your baby is tachycardic, um, if you are bradycardic, but you still um, have good variability, like you still have um, moderate variability, then it's okay. Sometimes babies' heart rates just kind of run a little low. Um, you know, I've delivered many patients and labored many patients where their fetal heart rate was right at like 110, 105, but that's just kind of how they were. Everything else looked really well. It wasn't like they were stressed or you know, um, having any other sort of decelerations, that's just kind of where their baby's heart rate lives. And it makes you real nervous because there's not a lot of room for error. Um, but sometimes you just have those babies that are, you know, real borderline low bradycardic. Um, absent variability, um, not accompanied with recurrent decelerations. So um, if I was absent but um, had no other decelerations that would still be considered a category two. Um, minimal or marked variability um, that you can throw that into category two. Um, Recurrent late decelerations with moderate variability. So if I'm having those late decels but my variability is still okay then that's not necessarily um, reason to go run and open the OR. That would still be considered a category two. Um, and a prolonged deceleration um, greater than two minutes but less than 10. So that deceleration that we saw kind of earlier in the strip, um, that would be considered a prolonged because it lasted about mm, four or five minutes but then recovered um, after that. So that would be considered a category two tracing. So if we have any of these, um, we're gonna throw it into the category two and it can change, right? And so if I'm having a perfect category one strip and then all of a sudden I have a variable um, just because my baby kind of rolled over on the cord and then rolled off and looks great and has never had a variable again well that 30 minutes section that they had the variable deceleration they would be considered a category two but if they went back to category one then they can do that so they can kind of jump back and forth in between these categories and so that's why we're always continuously monitoring our, our heart rate and adjusting what we need to do based on um, how the baby's tolerating labor and, and at what point of labor that they're in. Um, and then finally, just to kind of wrap it up, um, these are some great websites that you can look at um, and kind of spells out really clearly about fetal heart rates and fetal patterns and it, some of them have little quizzes on there that you can take. Um, and kind of test yourself and identifying what's what. Um, so I hope this was helpful for you. 
Like I said, if you have any questions or concerns, um, please come down to the second floor in the Student Success Center to come and see me. I would be happy to um, sit down and break this stuff down further. Or after your test, you can um, come down and we can review some test questions with you that way as well. Um, I hope you all have a good night and we'll see you later.